In ancient Egypt, there is a tradition known as the Masters of the Net. Thoth, Master of the Net, at Karnak. Now, Thoth is the Greek name for the initiator of the Egyptian spiritual culture, who the Egyptians refer to as Jehute or Tehaute. The idea that these are the masters of the net essentially means that these Egyptian initiates are being taught that there is an invisible blueprint of energy that makes up everything in our manifest world. In different traditions around the world, they have a name for this invisible blueprint or invisible matrix of energy that is geometric in nature, has particular shapes to it, and that makes up everything in our world. For instance, in the Hindu tradition, they speak of the jeweled net of Indra. Here's another illustration from an Egyptian temple wall. And what it shows is a being that in English translations is normally referred to as a god or a goddess. But in the original Egyptian hieroglyphs, these beings, these superhuman beings, are referred to as netters, N-T-R. The ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic language did not have vowels, only consonants, such as ancient Hebrew had. So these netters, the term netter is a foundation for our modern English term nature. Rather than translating this as a god or a goddess, we would more deeply understand the Egyptian perspective by understanding that these are netters or forces of nature. They are laws or powers of nature. And the different netters all hold specific qualities of energy that the initiate then interacts with. When we say that these are forces of nature, for the ancient Egyptians, these forces of nature, these netters, are fully conscious beings and they can be interacted with in a fully conscious way. So it's important to understand that for the ancient Egyptians, there was no dichotomy between a power of nature and a conscious being. Now the important thing for us here in showing the interaction between the netter and the pharaoh is that there's an intermediary between this power of nature, the power of the netter, and the human initiate, the pharaoh. And that is the form that is held within the hand of the netter. There's a form here of a scepter known as the waz, and the form of the ankh, which is very well known today in Egyptian study circles. These shapes that are held in the hand of the netter are actually geometric energy emitters. Now what I mean by that is that the actual shape of the objects themselves give rise to precise energies through which the Egyptian initiates could interact with the forces of nature and apply them for specific purposes. So when you look at illustrations on the Egyptian temple walls, if they show a plant, an animal, a scepter, a geometric form of some kind associated with a netter or one of these beings, we should always examine that because it will show us the particular quality of energy held by that being. Actually, what this is, is a geometric emitter of energy. According to the actual shape of this object, with this hemispherical cap at the top and these zigzag lines that modify the quality of energy, this is actually used as a pendulum in ancient Egypt. And from the base of this pendulum would be emitted a penetrating carrier wave of energy. Actually, every spiritual tradition around the world understands the existence of these subtle energies. In the East, they might call it chi or ki or prana. It has different names in different places around the world. But these vital energies, although they cannot be detected by modern electromagnetic scientific equipment, nonetheless exist and have a powerful effect on all living beings. So from ancient Egypt, the knowledge held in ancient Egypt went in multiple directions. And one place that it went is that some of the knowledge of the Egyptian radiesthesia became connected to knowledge held in certain circles in Europe in the Catholic Church. And so we see illustrations such as this, Saint Luiger, a Christian saint using Egyptian radiesthesia. In this old woodblock print of Saint Luiger, in one hand he's holding the form of a cathedral. In the other hand, he's holding the form of a staff. Now we know from uh, old Egyptian text and from the Old Testament that in ancient Egypt they used the form of scepters or staffs of different types for all types of energetic or so-called magical purposes. But as Arthur C. Clarke once said, 
Magic is simply a term that we give to a sufficiently advanced form of technology that we do not understand, so its effects seem to us to be magic. But when we understand this Egyptian science of energy, things that appear to be magic can now be understood as a type of spiritual science. So one thing I want to bring out here when we look at the form of the staff held in the hand of St. Luiger is that there are projections at various levels of this staff. So if he held the staff at one particular place, that gave him a particular length on the staff that correlated to a wavelength. So held at one particular place, he could detect, let's say, underground water. Held at a different place on the staff, he might be able to detect a detrimental energy spot on the earth that needs to be avoided. At another place on the staff, he might be able to detect a uh, powerful emanation of a spiritual energy spot that is very beneficial to all living beings and where they would want to build the cathedral. So in fact, showing him with the staff means that he has the capacity, knowing this form of the Egyptian temple science as it then moved into later eras and parts of the world, where he could directly detect the different qualities of energy, he would know where to build the cathedral, and he could even detect the form the cathedral needed to have in its shape in the sacred geometry of the cathedral, so it would have the right energetic qualities to be used as a sacred site. These researchers began to find many of the keys to the Egyptian temple science. Particularly, they did work on what was known as shape-caused waves. That was their term for the energy they could actually detect coming from different shapes or from artifacts from ancient Egypt that existed in France at that time. They could then take a look at something like a pyramid on a particular part of the planet and see how the 12 energies propagated in multiple spectrums around that object at that particular place on the planet. Now all that means is that particular shapes were found by the French to have a emission of particular energy qualities that were very powerful and that that emission of energy was fixed in place. It did not change over time. And so two of the very important uh, forms that they found were the form of a hemisphere or a dome, simply a sphere cut in half to be a hemisphere or a dome, or the form of a pyramid. In fact, the two are energetically identical. A dome and a pyramid have the same energetic qualities. Now another part of this is that the French had found that out of this spectrum of 12 energies, there was one particular energy that seemed to be the most powerful and the most penetrating. In fact, this one part of the energy spectrum, which the French called negative green, they then found that the form of the dome or the pyramid emanated from their base, this very powerful carrier wave of energy. And in fact, later on it was identified by other researchers that this is in fact a spiritual carrier wave. And the Egyptians that I work with today use that term to describe this energy quality. This spiritual carrier wave of energy can be emitted by specific geometric forms. The thing I want you to take away right now is simply the way the French discovered and could directly detect that certain shapes used by the Egyptians and other cultures will create specific powerful qualities of energy and that in fact some of these qualities of energy can be used as a carrier wave to send energy and information from one place to another place. So that when we look at the form of the Great Pyramid, what we find is that the King's Chamber, the place of initiation in the Great Pyramid where the sarcophagus was, which according to popular tradition, was the place where the initiate would lie and go through a three or a three and a half day death-like sleep where their spirit traveled through the higher worlds and then returned. In that place in the king's chamber with the sarcophagus is in fact at that exact deflection of six degrees, 15 minutes off of center. And so not only was the pyramid built to take advantage of this specific energy quality, but also it was even very finely constructed so that even the internal chambers could pick up very precise subbands of energy. So here they got a precise subband of the spiritual carrier wave which helped make this form of initiation possible. So through this type of research we're now rediscovering many keys to the Egyptian temple science.